Thanks for tuning in to the Cultured Meat and Future Food Podcast. I had the pleasure of speaking with Ahmed Khan from Cell Agri on this episode. Before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to Radical Snacks. They're offering 20% off through October if you use the coupon code FUTUREFOODS. Learn more and check out their products at www.radicalsnacks.com. That's the botanical spelling of radical ending in I-C-L-E. Our team is putting together the Cultured Meat Symposium, CMS 18, on November 1st in San Francisco. Tickets are available now. We'll be covering the topics of impact, future, and flavor of cell-based meats. Learn more and register at www.cms18.com. Ahmed Khan is the founder and editor of Cell Agri, a news and media platform that aims to be the homepage of the emerging field of cellular agriculture. The platform tracks all of the major and upcoming players in the field, providing them with the ability to post and share their latest news and job opportunities. Ahmed first learned about cellular agriculture while studying at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, and has been passionate about the field ever since. If Ahmed is not writing or working on Cell Agri, He's a huge cricket fan and loves to watch and play the sport. Ahmed, I'd like to welcome you to the Cultured Meat and Future Food Podcast. Thank you for having me, Alex. Ahmed, tell us a little bit about your background and what really inspired you to start Cell Agri. Sure thing, Alex. I'd be more than happy to share that story. I studied anatomy and cell biology at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, with a minor in political science. I did not know what I wanted to do after I graduated. I was certain that I didn't want to go to med school or into academia, but I did not know what else was out there to do. I was interested in exploring application of the life sciences in biotechnology, but I did not know where to start or what to do. And during my last semester, I was helping my friends host an event in the main student union building when the next group walked in, carrying a large tray of food. They said it was all mine if I sat through the next talk, and without realizing it, that presentation was going to change everything for me. I learned about this emerging field called cell agriculture and how this field was going to change the future of food. I was blown away by the concept and its potential implications in the world and knew I could be a part of this field. Following graduation, I planned to become more involved in cell agriculture, but as having a problem, it was difficult to find out everything that I wanted to know about the field, about the companies, about the job opportunities, about the news. There was no one-stop resource where people could learn about everything that was going on in the field. There was a need for this type of resource, and my cousin helped me realize that we could fill it and enter Cell Agri. That's how we got started as a news and media platform in the field. Tell us a little bit about what kinds of things that we can see on there that might be on there right now and where that content comes from. Like, for example, do you write all the articles or do you work with a team? I write all the articles on the Cell Agri website, and it's based on the news I find in the field. At the moment, there's no media platform, so that's where Cell Agri enters. The goal is to make Cell Agri the homepage of Cell Agriculture and the main platform where people can come to learn about the field. So that means the latest news on the industry, the latest opportunities out there, and the latest companies that are entering the field. What would be your vision of Cell Agri in the next five years from now? The main vision for Cell Agri is to become the homepage of Cell Agriculture and the main platform where people can come to learn about the field. What do I mean by that? So when someone hears about cell agriculture and this novel idea of how to make animal products from cells instead of animals, I see cell agri becoming the website where they go to learn about the field, to learn about how the field began, why it matters, what companies out there, essentially all things cell agriculture, from the research to where we are now, to what I can potentially go and buy now. We have, old, we have some more ideas coming out soon on how to further grow cell agri, but those are in progress right now. And so you came into the industry from background outside of cultured meat or cellular agriculture specifically. What have you learned specifically that has been really surprising to you? Right. And maybe what do you think now that you've kind of dug in a little bit, what do you think is missing from the industry? With my background in cell biology, I was not involved in cell agriculture from the beginning, but I've learned quite a few things since joining the field. One of the stories that really interested me when I first began was how the field was originally rooted in animal rights activism to an extent. It makes sense in hindsight, I suppose, but I didn't initially know 
the big role that animal activism played in founding the field. It was animal activism and vegans looking for a way to still enjoy animal products for other people without requiring animals that actually set this field in motion of looking to grow meat from cell cultures. And from there, the field grew to what it is now. A lot of people passionate about animal welfare, coupled with people interested in environmentally more sustainable food systems. It's a really interesting story that you really got me interested in how application of the latest sciences with looking for an environmentally sustainable food system have come together. That's something I found really interesting when I first joined the field. I kind of want to go back to, to your answer on this question, because you said that it really stemmed from the animal agriculture movement. That's right. But I guess Mark Post's team that developed the first cultured meat hamburger, it, they take more of an environmental stance. And the funding was from Sergey Brin. And I think it was more about his interest was in feeding the global population and kind of maybe tinkering with science a little bit. <laughs> we do see organizations like GFI, heavy on the animal welfare side of things. Would you say that there are any other groups that push on the animal welfare side? Quite a few startups, if you ask them how they first got involved in the field, most of them would say that they studied the current food system to an extent, and they realized the poor conditions that many animals have been in, as well as the frank, abysmal environmental record of animal agriculture these days. While it's not exactly the one or the other, there is a duality there. Without saving the environment, you can't really save the animals. There is a joint role there between both those fields. A lot of the pioneers in the space, animal welfare is a huge benefit. I definitely see that. Right. So let's kind of shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about the startups and innovators in the space. And we touched on this a little bit. If you had the opportunity to put together a portfolio of companies that you believe would succeed, which companies would you pick and put into that portfolio? Okay, wow, that's a tough question to answer this early in the game. Most of ad companies at this point don't even have a product out yet, so it's hard to say. To that extent, I can't really say which ones would succeed, but there are a few ways to, to identify which ones will in terms of some of their characteristics. So like in any field, the level of investment and key partnerships are going to be a big indicator of how well a company will do. In 2013, the first cultured meat burger by Mark Post cost over $300,000 to produce. It was recently reported that the cost has come down to be between 11 to $13 per burger, but there's still a way to go. Having a strong financial base to create your product or your proof of concept, a strong financial base to scale production at an industrial level, these are all important aspects to make sure you have the right opportunities. Along with that, the type of investment partners you're getting with the money is going to be very helpful. There are many venture capitals that are excited about this space, which is fantastic. They share the long-term vision that this space will be the future of food. But how many of them have experienced disrupting the food space before from outside of it using the latest biomedical application? For that reason, I personally believe that strategic partners will play a big role. Big food players like Tyson Foods, Cargo, like Bell Foods, and PHW Group in Europe. These are all players that understand the meat market and how to get access to them. Most of Meat right now is a great example of this. Most of Meat recently raised $8.8 million in funding, and the lead investors were Bell Food Group, a Swiss meat producer, and M Ventures, the venture arm of biopharmaceutical giant Merck, and that is a big one. One of the main obstacles for startups presently is scaling production. And Merck's expertise in cell culturing and scaling production will be invaluable to most of meat. Couple that with Bell Food Group, one of Switzerland's largest meat producers, you have another large meat player showing their support and interest in cell agriculture and cultured meat. So I believe these types of partnerships and strong levels of investment at this early stage is going to be critical to seeing which companies will do better than others and either getting to market first or just, or just being larger. You have extensive knowledge on the clean meat space, and you have a background in bio. Would you ever start a clean meat company yourself? <laughs> Good question, Alex. To be honest right now, I don't see myself growing a cell-cultured product anytime soon. Having said that, I do see myself continuing to grow Cell Agri and, and expand its coverage of the cell view agriculture space. As the field grows and continues to gain traction and progress, media coverage and sharing the field's narrative is going to be more and more important especially when people who are more hesitant and skeptical about the field's potential benefits emerge. One of the questions I asked myself a lot when I first got involved with writing for cell agriculture was, how can cell agriculture avoid the same downfalls and mistakes as genetically modified foods or GMOs? For listeners who don't know what that is, a GMO stands for genetically modified organism, and it involves the science of inserting the DNA of a gene of one organism into the DNA of another organism to enhance its properties. 
This could mean inserting a gene into plants to make it resistant to a disease or making microorganisms like yeast be able to produce beneficial products like insulin for diabetics. Yet, despite these positives that we now know, for the most part, we live in an anti-GMO world where people are afraid and try to avoid that word. How did technology that promised so much to sustainably produce all the food in the world suddenly become a word that everyone is trying to avoid? That answer actually goes back to the beginning of that field. When the first company released the first GM plant, they did not bother to promote or educate the general public about the technology or even share why or how this would benefit the consumer. Their main interest was telling other food producers like farmers about this new technology and, and how it would benefit them because they would be the ones, frankly, buying the GM seeds and plants from the company who produced them, but not the general public. No one tried to tell them why this technology could be beneficial. And part of that problem was a lot of the early people in the GM field were scientists with little interest in marketing communications. They were more interested in telling the public how they made genetically modified plants in terms of the science, but not why. No one tried to communicate why GMOs mattered or how their success could make food more sustainable. And that was exactly what was needed back then. So instead, you have this large gap in public knowledge and information about this new food technology. Are these plants safe to eat? How are they made? And what will happen if I eat one? With this little public information about the new crops and new food, other actors with other vested interests filled in those gaps, and obviously not to promote a new technology or product that they did not know much about themselves. And what emerged was a public that feared a new technology in their food and did not trust the companies behind it either. Context is everything. And the narrative why cellular agriculture matters and why these products are beneficial to the consumers matter. There needs to be a transparent source of information telling the story, sharing the progress and keeping the public up to date with all this information and reminding everyone why this field is relevant, why it's good. From the environmental benefits to animal welfare to health of the consumer having the product, these are all stories that need to be shared. And that's why I hope to continue growing Cell Agri to do more as people start to enter the field and start their own clean meat or culture meat products. You think that we're still at a kind of dangerous turning point to where people might look at clean meat, cultured meat, cell-based meat in a negative light? Or have we already surpassed that worry? I don't think we've passed that point just yet. The field is still small and people are still learning about it left and right. Until more people are aware of the field and learn the full story why, just hearing the idea of lab-grown meat without any context is very off-putting. <laughs> so until you show, show the full story why this is an exciting product, why we're ready to try it, people won't understand what's the point behind it, if that makes sense. So you're based in Toronto. Toronto is a very advanced, very tech-centric city. And when you discuss cultured meat with people that are not in the industry, what's the typical reaction that you get? And do people actually understand what you're talking about? That's right, Alex. I am based in Toronto, Canada. I actually read an article recently about how Toronto is becoming, if not already, one of the leading tech cities in North America. Apparently, in 2017, Toronto's tech scene was the fastest growing tech market in North America that created more jobs than the San Francisco Bay Area. Seattle and Washington DC combined. So sorry, Alex, might, might have moved to Canada sometime soon. But when I speak to people about what I do, there is a lot of focus on the tech space here in Toronto. They're generally aware of the idea of lab-grown meat and the original public tasting, as well as the potential idea of benefits, but they just not enough traction just here in Toronto yet. When you are describing cellular agriculture, do you call it cellular agriculture? What terminology do you use? When I explain the field to people overall, I look beyond simply the meat because there's leather, there's egg white, there's dairy products potentially in, in the pipeline. I say the phrase cellular agriculture and people look puzzled at first until you explain this is a field that includes and encompasses the lab grown meat that you've heard of before. And then it's like a whoa moment. And then you carry on saying why this field exists and how it happens and what other products are, in, are c coming out soon. It's good that there's a whoa moment and not kind of like a, a gross <laughs> factor. Because when we're talking about insect proteins, for example, quite a bit, there's this huge like ick factor where you kind of get that same type of surprise reaction, but in a negative way. So <laughs> I think that whoa moment is more excitement. Exactly. It's the whole idea about how context matters with everything. A few months ago, I believe, the Good Food Institute recently released a survey asking people if they would have clean meat. 
And in this survey, not only do they call the product clean meat and not lab-grown meat, they also explain some context about why this is product matters, why they call it clean meat, and why this could be the future of food. And given all this context beforehand about why this product matters, more than half the people on the survey said yes, they would try it. So context does matter a lot in this emerging field. There was a recent statement that was released. It was a letter drafted to the President of the United States from Memphis Meats and the North American Meat Institute, suggesting the regulatory bodies and institutions to govern cultured meat. And they also referred to it as to use the term cell-based meat. What do you think about the term cell-based meat? That letter had quite a few progressive points there. The first point you just brought up is the name of the, of the product as cell-based meat. The name of this product has been very contentious between players in the meat and cattle industry, as well as people in this culture meat cell ag space. So cell-based meat can be a good middle ground, which both sides agree with. It's a meat product grown from cell cultures, so therefore it's cell-based. The only follow-up question you have for, for that is, isn't all meat based from cells? So we'll see how that progresses. In terms of a regulatory pathway, that is also another key step. In the last few months, there's been a turf war of sorts between the FDA and the USDA about who should regulate this product. The FDA has expertise in regulating cell cultured products, but the USDA has expertise in regulating anything with the word meat in it. Instead of saying one should regulate the field over the other, it's this joint pathway where both institutions regulate the field is a good step forward where we get collaboration from both the cattle meat industry as well as the cell ag startups to make sure that this field progresses to be an alternative to conventional meat. Companies are saying that they'll be releasing cellular agriculture products by the end of this year. What are your thoughts about these companies are claiming this? And do you think that we'll see any type of cell ag product be released this year or even any type of clean meat products released this year? There are actually a few companies that have already released a few products, while others are still in the planning phase for that. I think it's very ambitious for companies to say that they will have their cultured meat product out as early as this year, while there would obviously be an advantage of being first to market for the first company to start selling their product. It doesn't make sense to me to rush the whole process. If this is only the future of food, you have to make sure every step is well planned out to make sure there's no error that could dampen or push this field back. Two of the original companies in this cultured meat space, Memphis Meats, as you just mentioned, and Mosa Meat, have said from the beginning that they're aiming for a 2021 launch. That just shows that they want to have everything right before introducing the world to their products, like addressing the many challenges Selag currently faces, like scaling production from the lab to market, or any regulatory hurdles along the way. I think you'll start seeing a lot more proof of concepts coming out towards the end of 2018 or early 2019. Many startups haven't explored scaling production to industrial levels just yet, and that process will take quite some time as well. So I don't think you'll see any products coming out just yet in terms of cultured meat. Having said that, while cultured meat production still has some time to go, other products in cell ag are leading the way. Bald Threads, for example, is a clothing company that uses cell agriculture to produce animal-free spider silk from yeast to make clothes. Bald Threads has already released a few products in limited amounts, Early 2017, they released the first spider silk necktie. And in December 2017, they made toques and released a limited amount of them, end of 2017. Along with that, you have the first cultured protein food product available now, the cultured pet treat. Wild Earth is the first startup to use cell agriculture technology to focus on producing cultured pet food. And their work offers a sustainable solution to producing healthy pet foods. As of this summer, Wild Earth has begun to do limited releases of their Koji-based dog treat, and that will be available for purchase online later this year. Koji is a breed of fungi that is a distant relative to mushrooms, and is already used in miso and soy sauce. So this product is now just being applied to dog treats. And even though technically producing cultured koji protein isn't growing an animal product as the rest of cell agriculture, the process of growing koji involves the same steps as cell agriculture like using bioreactors as fermentation tanks to grow the product. Along with this product, Wild Earth is also looking to produce dog and cat food that they plan to release sometime next year, I believe. So that's the current timeline on products in the field. There's been a huge interest in food tech and biotech in the industry in general and the startup space. What do you think has caused this recent interest? So there are a bunch of reasons here. Let's start with the increased interest in biotech. With more advanced research technology and techniques, 
biological and biomedical sciences are starting to have significant breakthroughs in their research more often. With constant improvements in biological research, there have been an increase in biomedical applications beyond the lab, like in pharmaceuticals or healthcare services. So as research behind biotech has improved, there's been more interest in it because for the first time, the possibilities are endless there. Personally, I went to explore biotechnology because I had learned about all the theory and research behind cell biology in the classroom. And now I wanted to see how it could be applied in the real world and how it could help others. And this leads to an increased interest in food tech. As more people are aware of how their actions impact the environment and climate change, food has generally been one topic that's been overlooked. We have focused on reducing plastics, how often we drive or switching to electric cars to minimize our environmental impact. But until recently, we have not really looked overall as a society at the food on our plate and their environmental impacts. That is, until now. More people have become aware of the environmental footprint behind their food, especially products from animal agriculture. Animal agriculture is one of the leading contributors to greenhouse gas emissions globally and one of the leading sources of deforestation. As people become more aware of the impact of their food, they generally want to do something about it, right? But how? For something as basic as animal products like meat or milk or leather, well, what could you do? Try vegan or plant-based alternatives? Possible, but until recently, these alternatives have not done the best of jobs to convince conventional consumers to change over. That just shows in the numbers. The global consumption of animal products like meat is going to nearly double by 2050. It's clear that people still want their meat, but there is not a sustainable, viable way for that, is there? That is, until biotechnology and the latest application of biomed sciences came through and joined the food tech space for cellular agriculture. To me, I have to call cellular agriculture the space where you have the application of cutting-edge stem cell technology combined with a passion for the food space and sustainability all coming together to have a common solution to help our environment and our world. So we have a question from one of our listeners. Bide from Chicago asks, can you tell us the difference between cellular and acellular agriculture? Cellular agriculture refers to the overall field of growing animal products directly from cell cultures instead of using livestock and therefore eliminating the need for animals. This mainly refers to the idea of using the actual cells grown to make the animal product that you'll consume. For example, meat. Cell-grown meat from cell agriculture, you're consuming the cells. And that's why that's the main idea of cell agriculture. In comparison, acellular agriculture is a category of cellular agriculture that involves growing and harvesting a product that the cell cultures make, not the actual cells themselves. What's included in this field is the idea of making milk from cell cultures, like perfect day foods, egg whites, like clara foods, and leather, like modern meadow. These are all products that are grown from cells, the actual cell being the final product. It's a bit technical, the differences, but overall, if you call both these fields cellular agriculture, everyone's going to agree with you. Luke from Arizona, he asks, I'd like to ask Ahmed his opinion on using cells harvested from cows as starter cells for the cultured meat. Will this have a public response similar to that of the stem cell controversy? And will this ethical issue affect the industry's progress? One of the main controversies behind stem cells originally was that there were embryonic stem cells coming from embryos, and that caused a huge ethical issue about whether that was right or wrong. In cell agriculture, the stem cells harvested are from adult cows from their muscle tissue samples. So taking a small biopsy of these muscle tissues, you can have many stem cells there, muscle stem cells. From that, that point in time, they derive future muscle cells. And so in that regard, I don't think they'll be that same controversial response, especially because no life is being lost here. The cow is just there as well. Hampton Creek, now known as Just, made a great video about this for cell cultured chicken. In the video that Just made, they used chicken stem cells from a feather. The chicken was not harmed at all. A feather was plucked. Stem cells from that chicken feather was used to grow cultured chicken meat. And in the video, they're eating chicken nuggets. While that chicken, those stem cells came from, is just walking around. That was fascinating. It blew my mind. And I believe because there's no harm to the animal in this process or to life per se, that same controversial issue with the origins of stem cell technology will not emerge here. So we have another question from one of our producers, Anita, and she asks, it seems like there's a big need for cellular agriculture right now is more scientists and experts in the field. So what do you think can be done to make cellular agriculture more attractive for scientists that already have valuable knowledge in medical biotechnology to get into cellular agriculture? 
So one of the problems right now in the field is as you want to grow it, you need more people with expertise in the sciences, in the engineering, in scaling production to join the field in order to get to the level where it can be competitive on the market. Because the field is so small at the moment, it's hard to get that talent, mainly because people aren't aware of the field right now. So as you get more media exposure, more and more people will learn about the field and some of our experiences will just be blown away by potential and how this can change the food system. I think the main obstacle for that is just exposure and knowledge about the field. Ways this can be overcome is continuing to promote the field or just being on the ground, going to universities and these programs and asking to talk to the people in the program about this field and how once you finish your graduate degree, there's this spot that waiting for you if you're interested in the field. Just helping more people with the talent and the background in those needed fields to learn about cellular agriculture, that's going to be an important step in the future. You can learn more about Cell Agri at www.cell.ag. And you could find Ahmed on LinkedIn. Ahmed, are there any last insights that you might have for our listeners today? This session is on the last question you just asked, Alex, but please don't be afraid to get involved in this field. There's so much exciting stuff going on right now, and more people get involved in this space, the merrier. I have been involved in cell agriculture for less than a year, and everyone has been incredibly helpful and open. So please don't be afraid to reach out to anyone. The only way this field can grow and become the future of food is if more and more people become involved. Thank you for having me right now, Alex. If you're interested in learning more about Cell Agri, you can visit the website, like Alex said, and you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter as well. Cell Agri is also on Twitter at Cell Agri Tech, and we recently launched on Instagram at Cell Agri. Ahmed, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your insight and your story on the Cultured Meat and Future Food podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Alex. It's been my pleasure. This is your host, Alex, and we look forward to being with you on our next episode. 